So ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the World Cybersecurity Summit. My name is Bhavna Bhatia and right now we're on our first panel discussion of the day. While well, we're looking at the government uh, panel discussion, which is on the cybersecurity framework and strategies for the African government authorities. While well, we're looking at talking about legal framework and strategies to fight cybercrime in Africa, we're looking at talking about enhancing oversight of cybersecurity within African critical infrastructure, cybersecurity for smart cities, advanced technologies for citizen safety, government initiatives to protect critical infrastructure, preventing cyber attacks before they occur, law enforcement to combat cyber crimes and cyber terrorism. Well, we're joined by our eminent uh, panelists. First up, Richard M. Carey, the Principal ICT Officer, Head Policy and Research Unit, Ministry of ICT, Innovation and uh, Youth Affairs, Republic of Kenya. Well, Richard is the headman in information technology with over 30 years of experience in the ICT industry and currently heads the Research Policy and Innovation Docket of the Ministry of ICT, Innovation and Youth Affairs. Thank you so much, uh, Richard, for joining us today live at the World Cybersecurity Summit. Well, joining Richard uh, would be Themba Mikwini, the Deputy Director, IT Audit Department of Rural Development and Land Reform, Republic of South Africa. Themba is a data science professional with experience in cyber, computer forensics, and counterterrorism. He's certified ethical hacker and leading the way for technology in rural development and land reforms. Thank you, uh, thank you so much, Shatemba, for joining us live today at the World Cybersecurity Summit. Well, we also have Arnold Mangini, the Director of uh, Information Security, National Information Technology Authority, Uganda. Arnold uh, has over 10 years of experience in planning, coordinating, implementing, and assuring national ICT and information security programs and helping users understand the threat landscape their roles and responsibility in the security ecosystem. Thank you so much, Arnold, for joining us live today. And we also have our moderator, Thifu Mohapi, the CEO of iAfrican Media, the Republic of South Africa. Well, with just under 20 years of experience in information and communication technology sector in Africa, Thifu has occupied various ICT positions in various organizations spanning software engineering, infrastructure management, project management, and more. Thank you so much, Thifu, for joining us live on the World Cybersecurity Summit. Well, uh, with this, I just request all our eminent panelists to please put your video on and audio on. Now, let's have a great discussion. Meanwhile, for all type it up in the Q&A section. Uh, over to you, Tifu, to take it forward with your eminent panel. Thank you. Thank you, Fukba Vani, for that great introduction. And thank you for the panelists for taking some time out to be with us in the audience today. I think we can all agree that uh, over the years, we've seen an increasing number of uh, cybersecurity incidents across the continent. And these range from anything from uh, phishing, ransomware, to data breaches as well. This also highlights the importance that uh, governments through regulation and other initiatives play in, in, in protecting citizens and infrastructure. Before we start, perhaps uh, to add on to the introduction that Bhavani gave, perhaps uh, each of our panelists can just do a short intro about uh, where they work and their role in cybersecurity as far as their jobs go. We can start with Richard. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Richard. And as you have heard, I work for the Ministry of ICT. Uh, innovation and with affairs. I'm the head of a section we call innovation, research and policy and cybersecurity falls under my docket. Now what we do is that we try to research on the best methods on how we can uh, protect our critical infrastructure because you know government, they, we hold a lot of data. You know, government, if there's an intrusion, it can be disastrous even to the citizenry. So what we do is that we try and look at what are the best methods because now the information technology is becoming now more per pervasive across the citizenry. So possibly you discuss as you go along. Thank you. Thank you for that, Richard. Uh, Anult, can you perhaps uh, share a bit about your role in cybersecurity? 
Um, thanks, Kapo, and uh, hello everyone. My name is uh, Arnold Mangeni, Director for Information Security at uh, the National IT Authority in Uganda. NITA is the short for that, and it was established to coordinate the growth and development of technology within the country. My role is um, I serve as a focal point in coordinating the activities that are aimed towards protecting the country, but of course, emphasis is given to government ministries, departments, and agencies, as well as their supply chain against um, cyber attacks, risks, and vulnerabilities that exist in the system that could hamper the utilization of ICT for the benefit of national development goals. Thank you. Thank you for that, Arnold. Um, Temba, could you kindly switch on your video and just give us a short intro on your role and your job as far as cybersecurity goes? Okay, thanks, uh, Tefo. I'm, I'm Temba Mgoni. I'm from South Africa. I'm working for the Department of Agriculture and uh, Rural Development, which used to be known as Department of uh, Rural Development and Land Reform, but it has now changed to being a Department of Agriculture and the uh, rural uh, development. So um, I'm a deputy director in, in, in information systems auditing. My role is to, is to conduct information systems audits, which include things such as vulnerability assessment, uh, penetration testing, and then um, give a bit back to my, to my, to my, to my uh, 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 department as to what is happening with regards to the department when it comes to vulnerabilities and stuff. Thank you for that to our esteemed panelists. And now uh, starting off in, in with given our, our panel discussion is titled Cybersecurity Framework and Strategies for African Government Authorities. I want to, in understanding these frameworks and strategies, could you perhaps give us an overview of some cybersecurity strategies and frameworks that each of your governments has in place currently? Perhaps we can start with, with, with Temba in South Africa. Okay, thanks, Stefan. Um, in, in, in South Africa, we, we, we do have a strategy. It's not known as a strategy, but it's known as a policy. Formally, it is known as the National Cyber Security Policy Framework. So that's the policy that was adopted by the cabinet in 2011, 2012. To, uh, so to as, as a formal strategy that is uh, adopted by the government to uh, sort of fight cyber crimes and the, um, uh, uh, be able to reduce actually the cyber crimes attacks in 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 in, in South Africa. So other than the other than the, this uh, a strategy, there are legislations again that have been put in place, especially in the past twelve years. Um, that are meant to govern or legislate and give guidance on issues of cyber uh, of cybersecurity. Thank you for that, Temba. I'll come back to that because I have a few questions, but I just want to give our other panelists a, a chance to give us an overview of the strategies and frameworks that the individual governments have. Uh, perhaps, Richard, you could share some of those. Uh, could I also yes. ask our panelists to keep your video on when you're not speaking, but you can mute your audio. Uh, thank you, Chair. Now, what has happened in the government of Kenya because of the increased incidences of uh, cyber security, we created a department which we call NC3, National Cyber Command Center. Now this department, what does is that, one thing is that it consolidates all the security incidences that have been reported because a security incident can be reported in one part of the country and then reported in another part. And so we, we can now know that it is an active attack which is taking place. We also have a cyber incidents response team under the same NC3. And what they do is that they so whenever there is a cyber incident, what they do is that they try to respond to it and also advise other state departments on the measures that they need to take. We normally use a defense in-depth strategy where we use 
physical, technical, and administrative controls uh, amongst the various what you call ministries, departments, and agencies, and also county governments. And normally in my section, what we do is that we use, we use a risk management approach where we try to identify the various cyber uh, security risks. Then we evaluate or we, we assess their impact. And then we come up with the appropriate control or measure on how to counter uh, such. So it is a multifaceted and multi-agency approach to dealing with cyber security. But what we have done is that all this has now, uh, in the last two years, been consolidated under that body which you are calling the NC3. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Richard, for that. And Arnold, in Uganda, do you, do you, do you have any coordinated efforts by, by government to counter cyber security threats? Um, thank you very much, Jeff. Oh, yes, what, um, indeed. We... Or if I may ask, what strategies and, and frameworks are in place? Excellent. Um, indeed, we do have uh, concerted efforts across the various stakeholders. What happens is the approach we've chosen to take is um, uh, before we do anything, we always do assessments. And uh, we've done now the second set of assessments, which is the cyber maturity model assessment. And uh, we've had uh, the privilege of being uh, supported by the Oxford Global Cyber Capacity Center, where they look at all our efforts across the five dimensions of cyber culture and society, the policies and strategies, education, training and skills, regulation, and the framework around the enabling environment, as well as internally how we are organized with the various stakeholders, as well as how we utilize technology. So from there, we always develop a strategy, which has um, some of the areas that we are prioritizing towards achieving a maturity level higher than the previous assessment. And then under there, we have uh, the National Information Security Framework, which is where the, the rubber hits the tarmac. Now, the framework has um, quite interesting uh, <clears throat> objectives. One, it, it enables entire government institutions, the ministries, departments, and agencies have a structured way of uh, approaching information security, as well as uh, addressing matters to do with information security. And of course, one of the other objectives there is to ensure that uh, government institutions protect their information and information assets, and of course, improve on their understanding of uh, information of cyber security risks, roles, and responsibilities. The, the other interesting thing is that the framework is applicable to the critical national infrastructure operators which means um, that they have actually to adhere to the minimum mandatory security requirements in there, and of course, largely improve the governance and environment. The, the, the key thing to note about the framework is it gives the baseline, which is the minimum mandatory security requirement, but everyone can go over and above depending on the, the type of institution, the nature of business they do conduct, and, and the information in there that they want to protect. So we, we, it has a couple of standards that enable institutions to undertake um, risk assessment and uh, as well as risk remediation, um, standards to enable them classify information because you know information or cybersecurity measures cannot be afforded to every type of information you have to prioritize because they're quite pricey. Then we have standards on personnel security, standards on, uh, on uh, asset management, data center physical facility management, among the others. So it, it, it is structured in such a way that one, it has uh, the topmost level, which is uh, the presidential directive, where the president pronounces himself on matters to do with cyber security. And then there's a, there's a policy, there's a handbook, which is a digital handbook, that is for all accounting officers, because their understanding of, of, of matters to do with cyber uh, is a bit not technical, so they need to understand just what the threat landscape presents and how they can support the various providers of players within the ecosystem to be able to do a good job. Then in there, we have a policy, which is implemented by now the technical people, because in there, we have controls that need to be put in place to try and uh, give the minimum security requirements the framework fails. The reason why we, we take it across the board is that the whole thing, notion of security is as strong as the weakest link, because the, the various government institutions share information, they share processes, they share all sorts of things, so they are connected in one way or another. So if you leave one behind, or if everyone does security in their own way, without pulling all those that are slow walking, then we might actually get compromises through some of those weak connections that we do have. So we have that together with standards and a very good enabling environment. We always do gap assessment 
to identify some of the legislative gaps that we have within our, our setup so that we can have the right laws in place to enable us to support our own operations as well as to collaborate with the other, other, other governments away from, from ours. Because remember, if uh, a crime is not a crime everywhere, it becomes hard. So the issue of mutual legal assistance comes in, but of course we have to have uniform piece of legislation or uniform crime so that we can support each other. Then of course we, we, we have, uh, as well as part of the same framework, try to build capacity of uh, investigating the judicial officer basically, investigating, prosecuting and judging so that they can understand matters to do with cyber. So when it comes to legal redress, they can be of help. There's a, there's a bit of things we've done in the ecosystem to try and understand. And of course, the fact that it's all concerted makes, makes it easy for us to collaborate with each other, which is very important because uh, sometimes if, if you don't collaborate with the telecom operators, it becomes hard to investigate or to get supported when something is within their realm. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you for that. Whilst I still have you on there, Arnold, and I would also like our other panelists to answer this question. Of course, uh, having strategies and all these on paper is one thing, but do you believe that uh, whatever measures your government has in place, those that you participate in and those that you don't, are they succeeding or failing? And if, if you can give some examples on, on where they're succeeding and where they're not succeeding. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we are succeeding, but of course not as fast as we would wish to succeed. Um, if you look at, uh, we've had a couple of rankings, uh, the global rankings on cyber, and our position has been improving over time, which is uh, positive. But again, on the inside, we have uh, extensive collaboration within the various sectors or various providers or service. When, um, for example, we have an institution that is providing critical infrastructure services, has uh, any cyber issues, they always run to NITA, which previously wasn't the case. So the National Start, which is under NITA, is actually doing an effective role, and everyone listens to the National Start when it comes to matters of uh, cyber. So the Start usually issues guidelines, issues uh, advisories, uh, indicators of compromise among the others, and we see there's a lot of um, implementation of some of the remedial controls that have protected institutions and prevented them from suffering from compromises because of uh, that whole thing. So yes, we, we do believe that is there's improvement. We've had an increase in the number of uh, professionals in the cyber area. We've uh, had a number of uh, courses come up and people undertaking them. So we, we are marching towards uh, the right direction. It's just that the speed is a little bit slow. So the only concern at the moment is speed. And that comes from the fact that we are not according sufficient resources towards the implementation of initiatives. Thank you very much. Thank you for that, Arnold. I have a few questions, but I'll come back to you later. Uh, Temba, in, in South Africa, do you believe that whatever measures, uh, strategies, frameworks that are in place uh, that are succeeding or not? Okay, thanks, Stefo. Perhaps before, before I answer that question, maybe if I could elaborate on, on our strategy, because I was very much brief. Um, uh, our strategy, as I indicated, is a national cybersecurity um, a, a policy framework. Um, it, 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 it details the different roles. Actually, it sits with a particular cluster in, in, in our country, which is called, um, which is a justice cluster. Sorry, it's justice, crime prevention, and security cluster. Those, that's the cluster that is responsible for uh, this uh, for this strategy. But this strategy is is being implemented by the state security agency through a particular committee, which is called a cyber incident response, um, cyber, a cyber security response committee. Now, uh, this strategy has got a number of things that it seeks to achieve when it comes to, for instance, the security products. It is it, the security products, the, the standardizations. It also indicates certain roles, for instance, the public, the, the government roles, the public sector roles, uh, the, the, sorry, the public sector roles, the, the private sector roles, the citizens. One other thing, uh, therefore, that is very important about this is that it tries to foster a working relationship with other countries because cybersecurity cannot, if you want to work in isolation, trust me, you're going to, you're going to fail. So it tries to foster that and it tries to promote the, 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 the cybersecurity culture in, in, in the country. 
try to, to come up with the standards or to adopt standards, cybersecurity standards, and to make sure that it is our, 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 these standards are being complied with. And then when it comes to legislations, we've got a number of legislations, but Electronic Communications and Transitions Act, our cyber, our cyber, um, I, I could say this has been the act that we would normally refer to when we come to, when when we talk about cyber security uh, uh, regulation in in South Africa. But there is another act, or oh, it's still at the bill stage, which is currently uh, uh, being developed, which is called Cyber Security Bill. So the importance of this bill, maybe coming to the question that you 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 ask about whether how will we tell if we are becoming successful? I think there's a very important section in that particular uh, act, which requires, for instance, the National Prosecution Authority to keep statistics of the, all the prosecutions, um, all the, the, the crimes that are being committed, all the prosecutions that are taking place, and also report it to parliament. So this will give uh, parliament a, a that power or an oversight, to, uh, sorry, to be able to exercise their oversight in terms of monitoring whether the country is winning when it comes to when it comes to cyber security. Then from an auditing point of view, also play our role as auditors. Because in recent years, it has become a norm, either in government or in the private sector, to for information system auditors to conduct vulnerability assessments and to conduct penetration testing exercises. This is important because it allows the, the, these organizations to know their weaknesses when it comes to cybersecurity and to put all of these down and be able to exchange them to try and improve on each and every one of those. So I think there's a lot that we have done in the country, especially when it comes to legislation. But I think the, 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 in order to be successful, when it, when, well, in order to be successful in fighting cybersecurity, I, I, I believe Africa, African countries themselves, in fact, they need to work together. For instance, the, in Europe, you've got one strategy in Europe, cyber security strategy in Europe. Okay, so it and when when countries work together, they can be able to fight cyber cyber security better than when than when we work in silos. So I think this is an area of weakness that I think uh, African countries, not just South Africa, but African countries should should will need to 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 to, to, to look at. Yeah, thanks, Stefan. Thank you, Tamba. That was quite insightful. Um, Richard, in, in Kenya, I mean, do, do you think that uh, you, you are being successful with the strategies and frameworks you have in place to fight cybersecurity threats? Uh, yes, therefore, we can say that we have succeeded to a good degree. Uh, because what happened is one thing is that we have now a legal framework. We enacted what you call a, a Computer Crimes and Misuse Act, which was enacted, I think, in 2018. Uh, we may not have seen a lot of prosecutions, but within government, what we have seen is that, uh, one thing that we did is that we tried to categorize our systems in three categories, what we call the low impact, medium impact, and what we call critical systems, where if there's an attack, they can be severely disruptive. Now, what happens with critical systems is that we have a dedicated agency, which is always checking on things like any uh, uh, attempts on intrusions and and then the report now to the to the national uh, cyber incidents response uh, department where you keep statistics I may not give you the statistics because now some of the government systems are quite sensitive but we have not had uh, more attacks on the critical systems what normally we do is that sometimes our people bring our uh, websites down Sometimes they deface them. Uh, we get out of spam in our emails. And those ones we are trying to look into ways because what has happened is that every MDA has its own uh, mail server. And what we are trying to do as a government is that we want to consolidate that into a single data center. And then we can have like those AI systems where you can be able now to know that this is unwanted mails. Things like viruses, again, we have not really had a lot of uh, challenges, but individual officers, they report that they have had uh, their computers infected with the viruses. And so what we have been doing is that we call those low impact because we normally tell them to get a good antivirus, 
But one of the challenges that we had is that there are some people whose computers were locked by alarm somewhere. And now they were asking for money and to unlock them. The good thing is that the critical systems are not affected. It's only at the edges of point of view which were affected. So we have those challenges in the government, like ransomware, viruses, uh, uh, spam, and so forth. But for critical systems, we have tried to do as much as possible to protect them. We monitor the traffic. We monitor any attempts on intrusion. We have intrusion detection systems. So we have not yet seen somebody who has really tried to bring it on its knees. Uh, uh, and so we don't actually have any serious attack. So the only attacks we find are minor or minor intrusions, but we have not had a serious attack on our systems. Thank you, Tefa. Thank you very much, Richard. I just wanna to touch on something that uh, uh, Temba, I think, mentioned. He talked about countries across Africa needing to work together. I, I just wanna ask our panelists perhaps to share, if you agree with that, to share how this could possibly work, because I, I would imagine some of our audience and myself included, you think that the matters of cybersecurity are similar to matters of uh, intelligence where sovereignty comes into play and it's not easy to share information across countries. So how would it work if countries had to work together around strategies on, on combating cybersecurity across Africa? Perhaps Temba, you can start on that. Okay, um, th thanks, thanks, Tefo. You know, to fight uh, cyber cyber security crimes, for instance, okay, um, it, it's 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 going to be very difficult if you are doing it alone as a country because these cyber cyber criminals cyber criminals are in fact an international network. So, for instance, if 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 you know that you are being attacked from a particular country in Africa. If we are working together, we've got a common one goal and one strategy to fight this. It will be easier to be assisted by that particular country in which uh, the, 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 the cyber criminals are, are, are sort of operating from. And as I, as I mentioned earlier, Europe is, is a practical example in this because they are, they are, they are, they are cyber security. They've got one cyber security strategy. Yes, each and every country will have their own, you know, uh, thing and so forth, but they've got a cyber security strategy as a whole. In 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 sorry in Africa, I've seen yes over the years we've got more and more countries who are coming up with strategies. For instance, I think about twenty countries in 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 Africa are now having cyber security strategies. But all of these strategies they don't talk to each other, and then we might have a problem in fighting the criminals as a unit because you cannot fight criminals as a country, you need to fight them as a unit because they are an international network. So if the African Union, for me, I think the, Afri the African Union will need to lead this and try and coordinate all of these strategies into, 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 one, into, one, into one strategy. And be, once, once you do that, it will be easier to fight the criminals, especially within the African, the, 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 the African continent. That makes a lot of sense, especially it's suggesting that the African Union would need to lead this. Uh, Richard, what are your thoughts on this, on having a coordinated effort uh, across and strategies across different African countries in fighting uh, cyber, cyber criminals? Yes, I think we need uh, to coordinate uh, with other countries uh, quite strongly because an attack in Uganda will soon come to Kenya, an attack in Tanzania or South Africa, maybe also an attack in Kenya because these uh, cyber criminals are worldwide. And so possibly what we need is a, is a body where we can be exchanging intelligence, where we can uh, be comparing incidences, or even we, if an incident happen, happens in Kenya, we can inform South Africans, we tell them the technique, they also tell us the technique of how it was perpetrated. And that we are able now to, to fight there the cyber criminals. So I think it is a good idea uh, possible for governments to come together and and try to uh, to deal with these particular uh, computer incidences. Uh, thank you, Tefo. I think there's a lot of noise. Let me just get somebody to be quiet. Thank you for that, Richard. 
Uh, Arnold, would Uganda participate in such a, in such an initiative to get governments across Africa to have uh, an almost unified strategy in fighting cyber criminals? Um, thank you very much. Yes, of course, um, Uganda would participate uh, because, um, like Campbell said, um, crime sometimes that is affecting incidents that are affecting systems in Uganda might originate from another country within Africa or even far away from Africa. So it is very important for us um, to, as countries, sign up to international conventions and treaties. It's actually very interesting um, when it comes to the Africa Union Cyber Security Convention on the Convention on Cyber Security and Data Protection, which is uh, famously referred to as the uh, Malabo Convention. And the, the fact that it's supposed to bring us together as Africa on matters to do with cyber, but it's only, I think only 22 countries have actually signed up, 14 originally signed up, and only eight have um, ratified the convention out of the 55, which is quite slow. And uh, the reason why in, in Europe, as an example, they are thriving when it comes to collaboration and cooperation is they always, I mean, accede to these treaties or conventions, like the one in Budapest, Hungary, that was signed the EU Convention on Cybersecurity. And they have actually tried to extend the reach of their own convention into other territories, like Africa, among the others. And we are having quite a number of countries interested in acceding to the EU Convention on Cybersecurity, which is the Budapest Convention. So we should indeed sign up to conventions and treaties, international as well as regional ones, so that we can forge a way of working together as, as, as countries to fight the vices. And of course, that can help us support investigation of crime. For example, if something is happening in South Africa, I can be able to make a call or find another way of reaching out to South Africa. And they support me during investigation because the crime is uniformly defined and we all ratify to the same convention. And uh, of course, another thing that we can do is to share information. Sometimes you've been hit as, uh, as, as Kenya, but you realize that, okay, the next target, like uh, Richard said, could be Uganda. So you alert Uganda and tell them there is this attack that we have just sent it off, or that has hit us badly, but this is how we manage to send it off. The IP addresses that are originating are from this country, or these are the blocks. So find a way of uh, having close monitoring of those IPs, or even block them if you don't have anything significant coming from them. So those are some of the ways, and indeed, I agree that we need to work together if we are stamp out crime. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you for sharing that. Now we're talking about different countries having sort of talking to each other to fight cyber threats. There's also something to discuss about within each country, is it necessary or is it already happening or not happening that we find that government organizations are coordinating their efforts with let's say private sector organizations. I'll give you an example. I know that in South Africa that financial services companies have a coordinated effort of trying to combat cybersecurity threats and they change information with each other. What I'd like to find out from you as our panelist is, do private organizations and governments talk to each other in sort of protecting the country against uh, cybersecurity threats? Yes, therefore. We can start with Richard on that. Sorry. Yes, just like I had alluded before, in our country we have, we created what we call the National Cyber Command Center. It was not just for government, but it was everything happening in cyberspace, private sector, government, civil society, anywhere. So what happens is that they have a role of advising even the private sector that there are some certain act active attacks which are taking place and these are the necessary safeguards that you can take. Mostly it is advisory. It is not that they enforce on it, but on the government side, they try to enforce, like have some mandatory actions where each MDA should take to protect their information assets. So they have come up with some standards which we can, uh, which every MDA can actually implement and they also do periodic audits to find out whether the controls are in place and are working all the time. But when it comes to private sector, all that we want is feedback from them to tell us that this incident happened, we were brought down by a certain attack, and 
if they have a challenge of even uh, recovering from that incident, the NC3 will help them in recovery efforts. But in the meanwhile, they have also taken the statistics about that particular incident, and they will try and find out whether it has, there has been another, another active attack in another sector, and then they, they can come up with an appropriate response. So yes, as a country, we have we coordinate between the private and the public sector on cyber attacks. Thank you, Tefo. Thank you. Uh, very briefly, as we wind down this uh, this conversation, Arnold, in, in Uganda, do, does the private sector coordinate their efforts with the government in terms of fighting cyber security threats? <clears throat> Thank you very much, Tefo. Yes, uh, they do coordinate, but not exactly directly. And the reason why that is, is uh, the issue of regulation, you know. When you're regulating someone, they are, they are wary on how much they can let you know what is going wrong within their own kitchen. So what we've done is we've created um, hierarchies of, uh, of coordination, where, for example, the banks um, coordinate on incidents within the Bankers Association, which is uh, a body that governs uh, commercial bank players. So they coordinate at that level. We've supported them, build capacity, so they can try to deal with the fire within their own realm, because our primary interest is never any other thing apart from something out crime. So as NITA, we, we, are, we, we are institutions, of course, that are responsible for regulating of, uh, of, of financial institution players, I mean, financial sector institution players. So for them, their interests are again different. Yes, now for us, we, we allow them to manage at that level of theirs, but should there be need, they escalate to the national task, which acts as the national command and control center. Thank you, that makes a lot of sense. Tenda, in South Africa, very briefly, before we move on to a very last question, is there a coordinated effort between the private and uh, government sectors? Yeah, thanks, Tefo. Um, the, the strategy that was adopted in, 20, in 2012 by, 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 by South African government, by the cabinet, in fact, it, it does emphasize it, uh, the role that should be played by the private sector, even though I'm a little bit worried about the debt part because it is not detailed. I, I, I wanted to go through and see what is it that the private sector, in terms of this strategy, what is it that the private sector is supposed to be doing exactly. But it's fine. It, 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 on the other hand, the, 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 sorry, the, the efforts by our own country they do in the, they, they, we do have something which we call cyber computer information uh, security incidents response teams and um, security operations centers which are coordinating all of these to make sure that um, we, the, the strategy to fight cyber crimes uh, is, is uh, successful. Thank you for that, uh, Temba. Just one last question, 30 seconds each. If you can share with our audience in each of your countries over the past year between 2020 and 2021, what trends, cybersecurity threat trends, have you observed that are on the increase and which ones perhaps are on the decrease? 30 seconds each, just quickly. Uh, yes. Temba, we can start with you. Oh, okay. Uh, again, thanks, Tefo. Uh, I think maybe there's a lot that we, we know. Um, and, uh, for instance, in South Africa, we can talk a lot about ransomware, we can talk a lot about malware, but I uh, just wanted to highlight something that I, I, I feel we are undermining. <clears throat> I think uh, data, data breaches are underreported. Um, you, 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 Yes, my, maybe some other people might think we, we should be worried about ransomware and, and the malware and so forth, but data breaches are, we are seriously, seriously undermining this. Um, when data breaches are taking place, it is easier for different organizations not to report. For instance, in terms of poor people protection and personal information act in South Africa, we're supposed to be going out, so we're supposed to be public about it if we've got a data breach so that everyone who's affected can be able to protect themselves. But data breaches are there in South Africa and, and they believe in all the countries and we are under reporting this. I think if all the African countries can start reporting these and taking them seriously, 
I think we 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 can move a one step closer to success in cybersecurity. Thank you. I agree on that with underreporting of data breaches in South Africa. Richard, can you share quickly 30 seconds the trends that you've seen, cybersecurity threat trends in Kenya? Well, uh, phishing attacks, farming attacks. There's a lot of fraud which is <clears throat> which is taking place in the in the country, especially IT related fraud. And then the issue of viruses, ransomware, malware. Those we have never seen a decline. They are just becoming more sophisticated. But fraud now has been a very, very big challenge uh, in the country across the finance and also the public sector. Uh, I think that has been the biggest problem. Thank you. Thank you for that. And in closing up and wrapping up, Arnold, in Uganda, are there any threats that are prominent or some that are declining? Um, yes, um, the ones that are on the rise uh, include uh, spear phishing. Uh, we have now targeted uh, phishing attempts, and uh, people are actually really serious on who they are aiming at and what they want from them. And then, of course, quickly, the other one is that. So, sorry to interrupt you there, just quickly to explain to the listeners that spear phishing differentiated from phishing in terms of that it's a very targeted attack to a specific individual, correct? Correct. Yeah, <clears throat> then the other one is that we are having exploit specific attacks where, um, of course, uh, some of these we get to know because of uh, the fact that it's in, 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 in talked by the intrusion prevention system. We, we see if you have, for example, a CMS that's running this and it has these vulnerabilities, you see an attack coming in specifically for that vulnerability. So we have uh, those ones on the uh, Richard as well, we have an increase in. Um, in, in, in attempts that are financial system. And of course, one of the other key things is that uh, for that, the primary weapon has now turned to become the insider. Thank you for very much to our panelists. And on that note, I'd like to thank everybody that took time out to listen to the panel as we discuss cybersecurity strategies and frameworks for African government authorities. Over to you, Bavana. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Tipu. Thank you, Arnold. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Nebo, for joining us today at the World Cybersecurity Summit. We absolutely valued all your inputs. Thank you.